Can you put a little louder, John? I think we're as loud as we go. Okay. okay. So we're going to talk about inflammatory disease of the knee. And talk about uh, rheumatoid arthritis, gout, office disease, infection, foreign body reaction, and some other inflammatory changes. Okay. All right. Uh, say, Elior, what do you think of this case? Okay, so we got radiographs, history of pain and swelling. Um, I see a joint effusion. Right, so you see the effusion right there. Mm -hmm. okay. Here's the MR. MR. Um, so I don't think the I... Both cartilages, see the mask. Yes. Uh, things look okay here, the sagittal images. Yeah, I think, uh, yeah, we see an effusion still, but... This is PD, this is T2. Okay. The effusion won't be bright on the T2. Right. Um, There's a T2 axial. Okay, so that would be the joint space, but it's not fluid, or not simple fluid. So... Yeah, could it be? So this is a disease that used to be called juvenile rheumatoid arthritis. People like to use other names now, such as juvenile idiopathic arthritis and a few other things. Uh, but this is synovial thickening and due to chronic inflammatory disease. So Greg? So 25-year-old male with chronic juvenile rheumatoid arthritis. Uh, coronal views. Um, looks like there's um, bone marrow edema within the lateral femoral and tibial plateau. Uh, yeah, and then there's an medial. Looks like there's like complete loss of, of cartilage right. there. Okay. The sagittal images. Sagittal. Um, Is so that like uh, some sort of soft tissue or thickening of the sino, or like so it's synovial thickening? So what we see here with the joint space should be, instead of having a nice, smooth synovial interface, it's very ir irregular uh, with kind of finger-like projections. And uh, But uh, this is a PD image. And usually fluid is going to be a little darker than this, though it's variable on a PD type image. Uh, here again, we can see that something in the joint space there. The other thing that you see commonly in JRA is, is small menisci. They tend to develop, underdevelop in JRA, so they tend to have smaller menisci, and this is all synovial thickening. And this is a patient who came with chronic juvenile rheumatoid arthritis and has developed uh, articular cartilage loss uh, uh, due to that. Okay, uh, Robert? All right, so we have a 15-year-old with pain. Um, looks like there's a joint effusion with some debris kind of laying in there inferiorly, so in some rice bodies. And uh, looks like there's some synovial enhancement. And yeah, there's just a lot more of those rice bodies. Yeah. So that this is a juvenile rheumatoid arthritis uh, with rice bodies uh, inside them. Good. Tayson. All right, so looks like we have a lot of synovial thickening and distension uh, and uh, an infusion as well. And you have the, I guess the anterior horn of the uh, lateral meniscus, it's a little. Yeah, maybe due to the oblique nature of the yeah. imaging here. And the coronal images. Um, yeah, I mean, I guess there's a uh, marginal erosions. Okay, so marginal plateaus. Erosions. A lot of synovial thickening here. A lot of erosions in there, and then you got bone infarct. Bone infarct. Yeah. So, uh, what do you think is going on here?
Uh, so this is rheumatoid arthritis. Okay. So some of the thickening and erosive changes, marginal erosions, and you can get bone infarcts in rheumatoid arthritis. You always have to think of concomitant lupus erythematosus if you see bone infarcts because uh, that likes to give people multiple bone infarcts. Okay, pain for six months. Um... Joint effusion on the sagittal view. Uh, the bone, the tibia looks, it kind of looks odd. Maybe some lytic lesions there, but not really sure. Okay. Here's the MRI. Yeah. So I think, again, we're seeing, yeah, some bony erosions, synovial thickening with loose bodies in the joint space. So how regular the synovial interface is mm -hmm. and erosions. And this is classic rheumatoid arthritis. We're hoping that you won't see this in your practice because this is really long-standing untreated rheumatoid arthritis. At this stage, we really should never see it to get to this point, but, but we will and you will. Uh, but uh, this is now a treatable disease, which it really wasn't effectively when I was at your stage. So this is something important to pick up early and get appropriate treatment before you get irreversible disease, which we'll talk about. So looks like we have more marginal erosion, or 49 year old male knee swelling for three months. It's like more marginal erosions, kind of diffuse or uh, spotty edema within the um, intercondylar notch there and uh, the uh, tibial plateau. Uh, synovial thickening. Some people call it the palace formation. Yeah, extensive uh, synovial thickening here, extensive panis with uh, large bone erosions. And then here we also have some rheumatoid nodules more proximally located. So rheumatoid arthritis. Okay, Robert. Uh, so we have a 49-year-old with left leg pain and without ruptured popliteal cyst. Uh, I do see pretty extensive fluid much in there that I think it looks like I have some debris in there as well. Could be a really big popliteal cyst. <laughs> okay. Uh, well, maybe we can rule out rupture, but we can't rule out a cyst. <laughs> And so this patient has had long-standing rheumatoid arthritis, and this was a, a massive popliteal cyst due to chronic inflammatory disease. So we're going to have a, another talk about inflammatory arthropathies. You know, basically the role of MR uh, is very much uh, debated right now, uh, and. Uh, the important things to know about rheumatoid arthritis, it's very important to make an early diagnosis. Uh, a few years ago, they completely changed the diagnostic criteria for rheumatoid arthritis to allow early diagnosis. The old American College of Rheumatology requirements for rheumatoid arthritis basically required that it be several years old. By that time, you get irreversible changes, so that was really untenable to wait to make the diagnosis when it's less treatable. So it needs to be uh, diagnosed uh, very early on. MR, I think, is very helpful in that diagnosis, as we'll talk about in the inflammatory stage, because uh, MR is the most sensitive way to detect uh, erosive changes, which are important uh, for diagnosing erosive rheumatoid arthritis that we'll talk more about. Uh, MRIs uh, may be helpful in accurately staging the disease for proper treatment and for following patients that are, have confusing symptoms to, to make sure that they're being properly treated. And we'll talk about that later as well. 
So in this case, uh, we thought of with worsening of symptoms at periodic intervals because MR can pick up a, a oste osteitis, which is the early stage of erosive changes, whereas other imaging techniques, including CT, can't. And therefore, it may be important for instituting uh, more aggressive therapy, but not all the data has supported that uh, assumption. Uh, okay. Jason. So it looks like there are scattered uh, bone infarcts in the distal femur and proximal tibia of, I guess, varying in age. Uh, the one in the medial condyle looks a little bit more acute. Good. So this is AVN. Uh, do you know any of the diseases that predispose to AVN and bone? And sicklers. Sickle uh, cell. That's a good one. I yeah. guess uh, lupus. Right? Lupus is another uh, one. And this was inflammatory bowel disease. Okay. Which also uh, is a big risk factor for development of multiple bone infarcts. Is that do with the cortisone, maybe? Did you, you say cortisone, John? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, there's there's kind of debate upon the role of cortisone right now. At one time, it was thought that it would increase the fat, especially in the proximal femur. And with a swelled fat, you would decrease the venous return, which would increase the risk of AVN in the femoral heads. Uh, now, I think the general feeling is that the chronic steroids can lead to osteoporosis, which can lead to subchondral stress fractures uh, rather than actual true AVN. But that, that's still something that's debated. Okay, so here we see soft tissue thickening uh, along the distal and within the uh, distal quadricep tendon, there's erosions in the superior patella. Um, I think this is, this could be gout. Yeah, this is very characteristic of gout. And notice if you see here, see how sharp the margins of the erosion are here? Mm -hmm. If you had CT, this would be a very sharp point. Uh, you don't see sharp points and rheumatoid disease. Everything is very blunted. Uh, superior pole, anywhere we have prominent insertions of tendons and stresses uh, or points where gout tends to like. Superior pole of the patella is a big one, almost as big as the uh, first metatarsal phalangeal joint. Uh, not quite as common as in the foot, but uh, this is typically what gout in the knee looks like. We'll see other examples as well. It's a tendinous insertion area, so it, isn't that the gout? Right. Um, yes. So we have a 63-year-old male right knee and ankle pain for one year, right patella belly mass. So the lateral uh, radiograph of the knee, you see this kind of irregular calcified density in the superior patella pole. You can kind of see it there. It looks like there's maybe some erosion along the cortex or into the yeah. patella. So on the axial and sagittal CP, looks like it's all mostly calcified there. Mm -hmm. But then it has a bigger erosive change. Here's the MR. So on the MR, looks like, is that a, is that a post contrast? I'm sorry, what? Is it is the end? Is that a post contrast? On yes. So it looks like um, so low signal intensity, but it's got kind of a heterogeneous enhancement. <clears throat> so, so also here you see kind of a heterogeneous peripheral enhancement. Did they biopsy? And this was the. Did they biopsy that or what? Uh, yeah. I'm not sure. The, the, I don't think that they, I, I don't know if they biopsied or not. They made a definitive diagnosis. You usually make it by biochemical means and uh, 
A clinical means in a joint aspiration, usually, rather than an actual biopsy. CT uh, can be helpful, which we'll talk a little bit about at some point. Uh, uh, typically, the, the one characteristic of, of gout, which is, uh, is that the inflammatory changes of gout tend not to be very edematous. Uh, they tend to be low in signal intensity on, uh, on fluid-sensitive images. You can get some heterogeneous enhancement like we're seeing here, but with rheumatoid arthritis and most of the other arthritis, you tend to get more of an edema pattern, <laughs> except for if it's really chronic burned out disease, whereas gout tends to be uh, less edematous for the amount of pathology you see, which is kind of typical. Robert? All right, so looks like we have a 44 year old with right knee pain. Uh, there's pretty extensive prepatellar edema in the patellar tendon, looks thickened and edematous, and then there's these two close out of echo intensity. Okay. Uh, a little bit of edema here in that inferior pole. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, seeing basically the same thing here on all these images. That's what it looked like when they opened it up. This is what they pulled out there, and this was tophaceous gout. And those were two little tophi in the tendon that they pulled out. Uh, when you have the acute, acute phase um, in gout, it, you, you do get plenty of swelling and effusion, et cetera. Um, so. Yep. Aphasia is gout is, uh, is uh, I don't know what the percentage is with the nodules, but uh, I, I, don't, I don't think that they're that often. Okay. Often seen. So it looks like there is some um, complex fluid anterior to the patella. I do. Well, it makes you think it's fluid. Oh, I guess it's not fluid. It's just some this soft tissue um, with underlying erosion of the anterior patella. Okay. And then this also is gout. Okay. So it's a very characteristic appearance of gout extending into sometimes in the middle of the fibers of the tendon and then overlying the bone with a little with erosions so the erosions and in time a bit much larger but the erosions didn't have very sharp uh angulated margins which is characteristic of gout uh, the treatment for gout has been around for a very long time uh, unfortunately people uh, are not diagnosed or or they don't take their medication like they're supposed to it's uh it's kind of sad to see some of the results on people that forget to take their meds. Okay. Uh, I, I, I sent you a piece of the wrist and then I had shoulder replacements, etc. all due to gout that, that was not treated. Okay. And he was seeing a rheumatologist, but uh, he forgot, forgot to take the meds. Hmm. And the furanol. Okay, left knee pain, radiographs, um, I don't see much right away. Okay, maybe some cortical erosion there, but yeah, at the insertion of the popliteus, some erosive change, I don't see the tendon well, gout, yeah. Well, here again, you say where their insertion of the uh, ligaments and tendons are, and that may be one of the ways to kind of um, pinpoint it uh, rather than call it the rheumatoid arthritis. Right. Good. And, and clinically, you can make a diagnosis. All you have to do is aspirate and send it to the lab for to just to see the needles. Yeah. 
I think John's probably going to talk about it a little later or whatever. Yeah, I, I, I have an inflammatory talk, and then I'll show what the crystals look like in that. So we'll probably do that in about a month. Yes, uh, 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 acute situations, uh, if we go in a little bit of a treatment, is anti-inflammatories are the first first thing you do is use them to, to, to diminish the inflammation. And then after that, you use a, a, a real treatment. Acute onset knee pain, so we have coronal and uh, axial views of the knee. Looks like there's uh, edema in the uh, lateral femoral condyle, um, kind of uh, right around the popliteus tendon. Um, quite a bit of edema surrounding the tendon, too. Yeah, some synovial thickening. Okay. Okay. And this was also gout. Do you have to? So, would you saw? Uh, would you have to have other findings to make the? I guess you can't just say. You, you, you can't. Make, you can suggest gout on an MR, but then then you have to actually have the. Uh, crystals in the biochemistry to make the diagnosis. And back in the old days, we used to sometimes, especially kids, we used to admit them to the hospital and and fill them uh, full of medications. Yeah, Robert. All right. So looking at the lateral femoral condyle again it's like a pretty large erosion there some heterogeneous soft tissue there there as well all this soft tissue you see filling the joint space and there you can also see all this synovitis synovial thickening and this was a chronic case of gout again You'd like to get these treated so that you don't get to that really chronic stage where you start everything starts eroding. Okay. All right, fifty-four year old male knee pain. I see an effusion with synovitis, some I guess attenuation of that uh, anterior horn, or is that just more thickened synovium? Okay. And I guess there's a some popliteal, yeah, heterogeneity of that popliteus. Yeah. So one of the other things that some people have recommended, though there's some papers saying that it hasn't been helpful is to do a dual energy CT scan. And uh, the uh, gout crystals and calcium actually absorb uh, x-rays differently at different frequencies. So by doing dual energy, you can uh, isolate the amount of uh, attenuation that's due to ca uh, calcium versus uh, uh, Uric acid. Uric acid. Thank you. Thank you. Uric acid crystals. And uh, classically, this is uh, described as areas of green uh, on most of the software applications. And so this would be a case showing the, the uric acid deposition, uh, indicating that this patient has uh, gout. And so th that's something that occasionally can be helpful. Uh, if you have a dual energy CT and there's some question about what the diagnosis is, or if you may have multiple diagnoses, how much of it may be due to uh, gout. Okay, let's see. You, you had the last one, right? Yeah. Okay. Okay, posterior mass. Um, looking at the knee here, it's been a total knee replacement. A lot of artifactual signal. There's a uh, pop cyst. There's a loose body that is 
ossified. Yeah, and have you seen a loose body like this before? Uh, no, not in that pattern, no. Oh, what do they call that? I don't know. Call the Roman coin. Mm -hmm. But uh, uh, when you get very large chronic uh, loose bodies, they tend to kind of calcify in this kind of characteristic pattern. Uh, <clears throat> In this case, we can see there are also a lot of fluid levels, and this is a patient in chronic synovitis uh, due to uh, uh, inflammatory reaction with the components of the prosthesis, and then uh, was there for a long time and developed the, the loose body as well. So this is chronic synovitis. Okay. This patient has anterior knee pain. Anterior knee pain, sagittal images. Uh, it looks like there's uh, increased fluid signal in the um, in Hoffa's fat pad, so I, uh, impingement or. So everything else looked good. Right? And here we can actually see that there looks like there's just a lot of fluid there, uh, with some of the fat uh, kind of missing. And this is a case of Hoffa's disease. And it's an inflammatory disease of Hoffa's fat pad. It can be due to penetrating injury and infection. Basically, any inflammatory disease. It primarily affects Hoffa's fat pad. Some people also believe that uh, we commonly see it in the superlateral area where you where you get impingement and producing a kind of a Hoffa's disease from Hoffa's fat pad impingement, which uh, uh, we see actually quite frequently now that we we know how to recognize it. Uh, I think this was this was uh, due to infection. Are those two completely different things, Hoffa's disease and, and fat pad infringement? It depends upon who you talk to. Uh, the definition of Hoffa's disease, you'll find it be different in, in different papers. I think it's basically any inflammatory disease of Hoffa's fat pad. The most common would be uh, impingement due to patellar instability. The second most common is probably due to surgery. Uh, the third is probably penetrating injuries. And then... Uh, uh, rheumatoid disease and other diseases are uh, probably less less commonly caused this uh, symptomatic Hoffa's disease. Though you saw a bunch of those rheumatoid arthritis patients already that had inflammatory reactions along the synovium of Hoffa's fat pad. Usually that's not their primary source of symptoms. Mm -hmm. Robert? Um. Okay, so we have two uh, sagittal images of the knee or knee pain. Uh, we have a little bit of a edema in that superior aspect of Papa's fat pad. Yeah, here are here the PT fat side images right in that area. Mm -hmm. and you can see kind of a prominent inferior pull of the patella. Uh, we go to the axial images. We really don't have a lot of dysplasia of the anterior patella. Of the, of the anterior compartment, but we do see we have a lot of edema in that superior lateral aspect of Hoffa's fat pad, and this was Hoffa's fat pad impingement. <clears throat> Most of the time, it's in association with congenital dysplasia of the anterior compartment and patella alta, where the displacement and instability of the patella leads to uh, the uh, lateral patellofemoral ligament pressing on the uh, uh, fat within the superior lateral aspect of Hoffa's fat pad, producing an injury to the fat pad and the edema here. Okay. Yeah, this is we're kind of looking in similar areas here. Yeah, so I think there may be some effacement of that uh, superior uh, retroquadriceps fat pad. Yeah, so this is what we talked about, uh, I think yesterday or the day before, uh, which is inflammatory changes in the uh, quadriceps fat pad. And, you know, I, I just find that MR alone is not specific enough for pathology here. So I don't like to call this unless I have some indication that the patient's symptomatic in this area. Okay, looking at the region of Hoffa's fat pad, there's... Um, looks like, so let me see, it's a regular signal that's well circumscribed. Hmm. 
I'm not, I'm not sure. Looks like there's some communication with the joint space. Okay, there's a defect there in the medial retinaculum. Maybe there was soft tissues here. Yeah, maybe an so if you just saw this, what what would you kind of think about? All this edema in the subcutaneous tissues and like a trauma laceration. Yeah, trauma laceration. In this particular case, this was infected, mm. and this was all in an, an infection. I think it was due to penetrating injury, previous penetrating injury, though. Mm. So we have axial T2 and T1 post contrast images. Looks like there's an effusion and an effusion and thickening of the syn synovium. So synovial. So, so right. So here we have diffuse thickening of the synovium, which is a little bit different than a lot of the synovitis we've seen or that you've probably seen. Uh, this is kind of uniformly thick all the way around. You know, we don't have that kind of fibrillated appearance that we often see in and typical synovitis, like with rheumatoid and so forth. And then uh, see this big effusion here. Uh, and this was a Staph aureus infection within the joint space. Roberto. All right, so we have a two-year-old um, evaluation for congenital syphilis. Uh, Um, not seeing a whole lot here, to be honest. Okay, so uh, and we're basically there's late development of the growth plates uh, for for this individual. On general syphilis. Go ahead, John. On general syphilis. Uh, how do you make that diagnosis? From the mother. From the mother. Okay. <laughs> All right. And it, it is, it's not as much. You can often see kind of erosive changes of the uh, distal uh, humerus and, and the joints here. I don't see a lot of that in this particular case. But the patient had uh, erythematous macular papules all, all over the skin and actually grew out uh, uh, organisms. And uh, this was congenital syphilis. And that's why we put drops in the kids' eyes also. Right. right. For, and for other reasons. All right, caffeine. I right, delivered quite a few babies. Swelling. Yep. Okay, so I noticed that we're kind of seeing the feathery appearance to the muscles a little bit more prominently than you would expect to see in a normal muscle. Okay. Here you can see this. Here's the MR. Um, so it looks like there's subcutaneous and muscular uh, edema. Okay. Kind of involving the soleus, maybe a little bit of the... Gastrocnemia, a lot of sub subcutaneous edema, a kind of ill defined enhancement. It's like a. And this was necrotizing fasciitis yeah. Yeah. and uh, acute gangrene. This patient, this was all infected. And well, one of the things about, about uh, this condition is you have to open. Uh, as soon as you suspect it, you have to drain it, open it, and fill the patient full of antibiotics and uh, keep a sharp eye on these people because it contain it's a very fast um, growing uh, condition that goes proximally. Yeah, and you can get swelling that can block off the vascular supply, and you can get infarct of the entire compartment muscles if if you don't treat it rapidly. And as John said, incise the fascia so that you decompress the pressure. Okay, here's just another example. This is a big uh, uh, abscess uh, where you see a, a lot of uh, 
edema here, and this is also diagnosed as necrotizing fasciitis. So this is predominantly subcutaneous, not quite as dangerous as the previous one we saw. Okay. Um, it does have good long treatment. That's right. Okay, so here it looks like concern for infection. I'm looking at the image here. We have we have these little fluid collections with rim enhancement, Botox injection. Yeah, these could be little abscesses with myositis. Let's see here. Let's see, it looks like a lot of these little things that look like little micro abscesses. And this is Botox monomer process. Mm. It's fast, getting treated for tremors and so forth. Uh, but uh, some people are very sensitive to Botox and they get myonecrosis. Ten year old female with two year history of anterior knee pain, roll out internal derangement. So we have sagittal images here, which show. Uh, is there something, yeah, some of the uh, dark signal, low signal intensity in the posterior uh, patellar space? Yeah, so that's all through the posterior patellar space. Um, and the history is what's important here. The patient was previously treated for meth resistant staph aureus. Yeah, so that's like post inflammatory sc uh, scarring. Post inflammatory scarring uh, after treating for meth resistant. Disease, Robert. Uh, let's see. We have a AP and lateral on the knee. Um, thirteen-year-old with multiple prior traumas and a sticky knee. Um, it looks like I think I see like a rounded lucency over the lateral or medial femoral condyle there. Yeah. Don't really see it on the lateral. But... Yeah, it's a little hard to see it on the lateral. A little easier on the MR. Yeah, no, no. Looks like there's some what fluid signal in there. What is this? They're running a demon. I'd be concerned about infection. Okay. Is there a name for this kind of infection? Uh, like an abscess? Brody's abscess? Yeah, right. So that's a typical Brody's abscess. You know, I used to see these all the time. I don't know what the change is now, but... I haven't seen a Brody's abscess in a while, but I used to see them at least once or twice a month. Uh, but the last few years, I've seen fewer and fewer Brody's abscesses. And so the situation here is that the, you get bacteremia, usually with staph aureus, uh, can be strep, but usually staph aureus. The, the uh, bacteria lodges in the end arterioles and they really like the distal metaphysis of the femur. That sets up a local infection where you get a local abscess. Uh, in the early stages, it stays in the metaphysis, but as it goes to grow, it can actually eat itself through the growth cartilage into the epiphysis as well. So this is pretty common. Usually this occurs in the older ages. If it's a younger where you have a lot of growth cartilage, then you have to be very concerned that this, when it heals, can lead to bar formation and uh, deformity of growth. So these have to, the younger kids, they have to be watched pretty carefully. Um, 13 years um, is a not uncommon age for, for this. Okay. Uh, it's in, infants and 13 year olds, and, and, and for some reason I remember nine year olds. Okay. And then uh, there's a spike in, in, in this problem in, in those age groups. Thank you. I think that's because the two-year-olds, they climb and fall and get abraded, et cetera. Uh, 13-year-olds, they're playing baseball or whatever. They get okay. spiked and et cetera. Uh, Nine-year-olds, they also become a little more active. Okay. Uh, Okay, so here, left leg swelling, we see uh, lucency in the medial aspect of the uh, distal femur. 
again at the region of the metaphysis there's this fluid collection with rhythm enhancement be concerned for Brody's abscess yeah edema there okay that's a 13 year old female right knee pain for several months so we have a frontal and lateral radiographs um, looks like there is like an irregular lucency in the uh, tibia. Yeah, right there. The, the main thing you want to know is as it crossed the physis, that's, that's, you want to catch it before it crosses the physis. So it looks like, so we have coronal images here, T1, T1 post contrast. You see the, Fluid collection in the tibia. It looks like it, on, especially on that T1 weighted image, it doesn't look like it's crossing the physis. It's like like bowing of the physis. I'm not sure. Well, you're going to, when you uh, operate on these and scrape it, uh, you're going to be you're pretty darn close to having problems here. Okay. Um, but it's a girl, so the growth is not as long as a boy. Uh, which is a good thing. Yeah. Uh, Robert. Uh, we have a 48 year old with knee pain and osteomyelitis yeah, versus reactive marrow. So this is what they're concerned about. Yeah, the tibia of the marrow looks pretty heterogeneous. Out. Yeah, it looks like a bunch of worms that are a little out of focus. That's characteristic of this kind of a condition. Here are the plain films. Um, plain films and the CT. No, not too much. Yeah. No, no x rays. Oh, and uh, the, this was acute osteomyelitis. With these kind of this is kind of a characteristic appearance. Uh, I saw a child from Nigeria that involved the entire tibia, and it was sensitive to all the antibiotics, including penicillin. Well, wow. all right. So we have some small field of view images of her femur. I see a kind of an eccentric lucency and maybe some thickening of that uh, cortex. Uh, yeah, I mean, the lucencies within the, the cortex, a little bit of yeah, parallel reaction. Here's the MR scan. Okay, so got a, some medullary edema and uh, a lot of periosteal thickening. Uh, I don't know. It looks infectious, but I, I okay. I don't like, know that. Yeah, the first thing that comes to my mind, it looks like there's a little nidus in this, which we can see by the MR. Uh, maybe you could make one out on the CT, but it's not as clear as it should be on a CT. Uh, it should be very dense on a CT. I think of osteoosteoma. You can get very large inflammatory changes in the soft tissues adjacent to osteoosteomas as well as within the bone. That's not what this is, but that would be one of the first things I would think about. And this is something that actually is rarer than that. Would a CT help in the... Here it is. Uh, sorry, osteoma. There's the CT, John. Well, that is, yeah. I, I... Yeah, again, usually the osteoditis and osteoma. But you should see a nidus yeah. and you don't see it. Yeah, this isn't dense enough to really be the nidus. And this turned out to be an intracortical abscess, which was staph aureus. <laughs> oh, wow. Okay. 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 
abrupt onset pain, mild fever, radiographs here. Nothing's jumping out at me so far. Okay, we see a lot of edema in the There's femur. The MR. There's the x-ray again. Uh, let me see, the femur. Too much. Yeah. Yeah, a lot of edema in that diaphysis. There's periosteal stripping with subperiosteal fluid, a lot of surrounding edema. Um, it was abrupt. I mean, could it be traumatic? I know <laughs> we're talking about infection, but... It could be trauma more the infemorization, but I... Unlikely, to, very unlikely to be trauma. Okay. This is very characteristic of osteomyelitis in a kid. Uh, that, that, that would be the first thing I'd think of. And a well, very characteristic okay. thing here is this collection, subperiosteal collection. You get subperiosteal abscesses in kids. You don't get that in adults because the periosteum in adults is very firmly attached to the cortex. But in kids, it's less so. So you'll often get these fluid collections. You can get these with trauma when you get hemorrhage into it, but it's much more common in infection with osteomyelitis, and then you see all the inflammatory changes around it. So, uh, and the bone scan is positive there, which a lot of everything would be, but this is osteomyelitis with a characteristic subperiosteal abscess. Uh, why, don't, why don't we stop here, and we will uh, pick up and finish the inflammatory changes next Tuesday, okay? Uh, off Monday? Off Monday. Monday is a holiday. Okay. Right. Well, that's right. We work real hard. And yeah, these, these, guys are told me, these guys told me that they weren't going to work on, on the holiday. <laughs> Have a good weekend, everybody, and watch out for those drunk drivers. All right. Yeah. Thank you. You too. Thanks.